Uh, okay, so Gibbs. So to begin with, Gibbs, you know, it's a funny thing. Gibbs is also doing statistical mechanics. It's not really a new topic. He's covering the same topic that, that Boltzmann already did. Uh, <clears throat> it's a different kind of definition of statistical mechanical entropy. And a very different, just conceptually very different, mathematically very different. Uh, in particular, whereas Boltzmann's definition of individualist is a single system in virtue of its precise actual state, given the partition, has a Boltzmann entropy. It's well defined. It has nothing to do with a, an ensemble of anything. It has nothing to do with ignorance of anything. It's just a fact, given those parameters, what its Boltzmann entropy is going to that partition. Uh, but the Gibbs entropy is not a function of the state of an individual system. It's a function of a probability distribution over phase space. Uh, so we usually use rho for probability measure, or you know, or something that, that integrates to a probability measure where it doesn't have a probability density. And uh, you know, so the conceptual question is this one, what the hell is it? <laughs> and, you know, mathematically it's perfectly well defined, but that's not our question. Our question is, what is, what is this thing, right? What, what, what would make it physically correct to say this is the value get for, for this box of gas in front of me, or for, I mean, whatever, you just have to understand what the hell is going on. Um, does it have to do with having an ensemble? If you have a huge infinite ensemble, then you can talk about the distribution of states within that ensemble. Uh, obviously, if people, you're talking about someone's knowledge of the system and their credences, then their credences can be spread all over phase space because they don't know where the damn system is and they have some variable opinions about where it might be. Um, but until you know what that row is, represents, you basically, you know, you're doing something mathematically well defined and conceptually completely obscure. You no idea what you're doing. So anyway, given this row, Gibbs defines S minus, again, usually you have this K, sometimes it's K sub B, Boltzmann's constant, uh, row or row. Some, in this case, I'm doing a finite I have a finite space over which this probability measure is defined. So I just index the elements of the space with i. And to each of those elements, I assign you know, a real number between 0 and 1 that all sum into 1. And then I just sum, taking each, for each of the elements, taking its probability and weighting it by the natural log of its probability. Okay, that's a number. And I take it, I multiply it by some k, and I take the negative of it. Which, again, you know, this, this negative sign shows up in the, Bolt, in the Boltzmann definition. There's no negative sign. It's just ln omega, and the bigger omega gets, the bigger the entropy gets. But this has a negative sign in front of it for reasons we're about to see. That means why it has to be negative if you want entropy to go up. Uh, Okay, so what what is this object, right? What is it? What is it characterized? Or what is it measured? What is it? Uh, so the intuition is somehow it measures how spread out the probability measure is over the possible states in the system. And let's just check simplest possible interesting case. You have two possible states: states A. And Systems either in state A or state B. Uh, suppose the probability for it to be in state A is 1. So the probability is all concentrated on one of the two states. Then we get the S. So we have the minus K part. And I, I'm sorry if this is boring you, but I had to do this myself to understand what's going on. And you say, OK, here, the ln1 part, where ln1 is 0. So that kills off this term. And here, the 0 kills off that term. 
that's always zero. Right? So if you, if you concentrate all the probability in one of my elements, the entropy is zero. Uh, what if I concentrate 75% on A and 25% on B? And then you just do the calculation. Of course, what happens is this natural log is always going to be of a number between 0 and 1, so it's going to be negative number. And you weight that, and you add those up, and you get a negative number in here, but you put the negative out here, or else your s would be negative. That's what we, I mean, you're trying to match an entropy you already have that's always positive, so you better stick a negative here, and you stick the k in, and you get for a 75-25 distribution, this is, the, this is the Gibbs entropy, and at a 50-50 distribution, which is in a way, one might say, maximal uncertainty about where the system is, or having spread the probability measure as evenly as you can over all the possibilities, uh, then you just do the calculation and it maximizes, this actually maximizes the Gibbs entropy at that value for, for a two-state system. And that generalizes if the state has any finite, if the system has any finite number of states, the Gibbs entropy will be maximized in a flat probability distribution that just gives you know, one over n probability to each of the possibilities. And if you have a you know, continuous Cis continuous state space and you're really putting a probability density on it, the Gibbs entropy is going to be maximized in a flat, a flat probability distribution over the entire space. The more calmed up it is, the lower the Gibbs entropy. And that's just math. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is what I just said. In some sense, the Gibbs entropy takes its highest value in every possible state is in some sense equal to probability. Whatever this probability means. Uh, and the key question for me, and this is, yeah, I, this is just, I asked, last year I asked Kevin Coffey to give the thing on Gibbs entropy because I didn't know what to say about it. I, I just honestly have no idea what's going on with it. I mean, I understand mathematically what's going on. But physically, I don't know. And I mean, I know Wayne is much more Wayne is much more sympathetic, and, and I, I will give you you will have a nice chance to yeah, I'll, explicate. I'll, I'll talk tomorrow about this. Okay, rather, but, rather than getting into that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, we should have that. I mean, I sort of dumped it on Kevin, right. and Kevin did a kind of you know valorous job, but he at the end said he didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> and you know, this is just this. I'm just being honest. If somebody can stand up this way. Uh, you know, what does Rho represent? Is it a statistical description of an ensemble of systems? Is it, you know, if that were true, then obviously I could change the Gibbs entropy in some sense of this system just by picking it up and sticking it in another ensemble and not changing it physically at all, right? Which sounds kind of strange. You might say, how can I change, you know, I'm not changing an intrinsic physical feature if, it's, if it depends on the ensemble. Is it, you know, something about a previous function, then we're measuring people's beliefs, and then we get to, you know, David's observation that it better not be the fact that an ice cube melts in warm water depends on somebody's ignorance. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to say more tomorrow, but just may add a little footnote. Yeah, good. Right. Oh, good. So, um, you're saying you're, uh, at a certain point, people really, everybody working on this realized that there's no way you're going to get at the statistical mechanics um, that, um, that um, the strict laws of thermodynamics. Right? It's, right. it's not, you know, it, it, if, if, um, if, if, um, if it, it's, it's, it's not impossible for it to degree decrease. And what everyone said, well, that's only very, it's only, what well, we get is something that's very probable. Right. And if you think about Maxwell's demon raising and lowering that little thing, um, what we want to say is, well, it's possibly it might end up with a really hot side one or a cold side, but due to a lot of large numbers, that's, that's very improbable. And Boltzmann said things like that too. So whoever you are, I think it is, it, it, it is necessary to make sense of that kind of probability talk. Right, right. Right, so so, it, so when you say what the hell is 
this, it is, it's, it's a good question, but I wouldn't say it in a dismissive tone that says, well, let's just banish all okay. the so, Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, think of, I, I, as I said, think of it as a challenge. Right. I, I'm happy to be yeah. educated, I need it, yeah. Uh, perhaps in you know, a similar spirit, but uh, regarding the, 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 the criticism that you're presenting now to the case of Boltzmann, wouldn't you say that by changing the partition without doing anything to the system, I can change the entropy of, the, of, of, well, of, of that individual object that you have? What, what I would say is what I said before, that if you're being very careful about Boltzmann, you should subscript every entropy to the partition. And so, of course, S sub this partition can be quite different from S sub that partition. And that doesn't bother me because those are two different entropies. Right. Could there be something similar here in regarding the ensemble? It in could which be. You locate? If, if, I, 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 it could be. I, I don't. I mean, if I change, if I change in the Boltzmann case from one partition to another, presumably it's because I care about. You know, in this context, I care about this partition. It partitions along lines of properties that I'm interested in. And the other partition, I'm in another context, and I care about a different set of properties. And so that's the relevant partition for what I'm doing. Now, you know, the, maybe you can give me a story like that. Yeah. Um, um, so let me propose a naive interpretation so it can be shot down, okay. or, or not. Um, um, I, I have no idea, historically, if this is what Gibbs does. But if I try to connect it up to talk about thermodynamics, which he must have had somewhere in the back of his mind, um, um, why wouldn't I say, so I, I partition up the face that, as in the Boltzmann case, um, I, uh, uh, I I partition up the phase space into thermodynamic macro space, and then I take it to be some kind of regularity of nature um, that when a system is in a certain macro state, um, um, there's a certain amount. You know, you ought to be willing to bet that it's in this or that subregion of the macro state. That gives you a distribution. For macro states whose volume is larger, that distribution will be wider and will correspond to higher Gibbs entropy um, than than for the ones whose whose volume is lower. Doesn't that? I I, I, I understand. I mean it. Now it just sounds like an alternative phraseology. I'm not sure yeah, what you're it dating close to get from going oh, from the volume that. to essentially a flat measure over the volume, which is basically giving you back the volume. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it refers to some, here's how it's different. It, it, uh, there was no need in defining the Boltzmann entropy to talk about any such regularities as the ones I cite. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here is, he, here you're taking it to be a, an important feature of a certain mental okay. state that you want to refer to. Okay, so, right, I guess if we were to go, which I don't think we should, maybe we can do later, you know, maybe this will come up naturally later. Um, the regularities you're talking about, if I do the individualistic Boltzmann approach, ought to come out to be typical yeah. Features of right. the trajectory. Sure. So then you just want you embed that in a notion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now here it's it's coming out in a different yeah. place in the presentation. Yeah, yeah. In Boltzmann, it's not part of the definition yeah. of entropy, but it's going to come yeah. out. You know, it's going to come yeah. out in the dynamic treatment of right. statistical mechanics. I mean, here yeah. it's part of the definition of entropy. Right. In in so far, I mean, look, in so far as anybody can do the job of of making me see how what Gibbs is really doing is what Boltzmann is doing right. in a different language. Then right. of course, because I understand Boltzmann. No. But this no, my understanding of Gibbs becomes parasitic on my That's what I'm trying to do for myself. Uh, right. But there are problems with the Gibbs entropy, as we're about to see, that do not arise with the Boltzmann entropy. So uh -huh. it's very hard to see the one is just a crypto presentation. Uh -huh. uh, I just want to add a thought. So you, you, like if you're wondering, was Gibbs thinking about um, thermodynamics? Yeah. 
Um, so Tim has presented this entropy here, and here's the definition. What I'm going to do tomorrow is suppose you want a quantity that's going to play a certain role analogous to entropy and thermodynamics, right, right. and show that this is uniquely it. Right. Yeah. So I'll do that tomorrow. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad to leave that. Track. Maybe that's about all I have to say. Oh, here I want to go through this fact, right? If we allow the probability distribution, so we put a probability distribution on phase space, and we allow it to evolve under a Hamiltonian flow in the normal length, whatever value you assign to a point, you just follow the Hamiltonian flow and let it flow along those flow lines. Uh, then you have this peculiarity that the Gibbs entropy remains constant. So no matter what the hell the, this thing is doing, entropy never goes up. And if you were trying to recover the second law of thermodynamics, you might think this is a drawback. This is obviously not a drawback in Boltzmann, because Boltzmann, the Boltzmann entropy just typically does go up. Right. If you've got an isolated system. Not yeah. Right. yeah, so yeah, so this would bring in an I am of course thinking of an isolated system. This is where people say, oh, you need to bring in outside, you know, interventions in order to get thermodynamics, and that just seems crazy. Like, you know, oh, I make a spaceship and I just send it out into an empty space. You mean ice cubes won't melt anymore? I mean, you just kind of, you know, it blows your mind. What could you have in mind? Uh, that this fact, of course, follows from Wooten's theorem, which finally makes it makes an interesting appearance in our discussion. Uh, but this, on the way I was construing it, this wouldn't be a problem. I, I was construing it in a way, as you rightly said, that's more or less equivalent to both. Okay. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So I just want to make a historical thing now. Yeah. People sometimes present this as if this is a criticism of Gibbs. Yeah. This is Gibbs argument. Yeah. You got this argument from Gibbs, whether you know it or not. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, wait, but to what conclusion? Yeah, so okay, 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 yeah. So <laughs> My conclusion is I don't know what Gibbs is doing. Right, that yeah. So, right. So, um, so, thermo so um, as you said, said earlier, thermodynamic entropy is defined only for equilibrium states. And um, um, Gibbs rate in introduces this, 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 this quantity and says, well, it's maximized in you know, certain equilibrium states and raise the question, who, oh, 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 with thermodynamic entropy, it's not clear whether there is a generalization to non-equilibrium that can be used as to track right. progress towards equilibrium. Gibbs raises the question, can this Gibbs entropy be used as something to track uh, um, progress towards equilibrium, mm -hmm. and he gives the answer no for precise right. reason. Okay. So he does not ever propose this as a way of of um, tracking um, progress towards equilibrium. And then what he says is, well, um, then he introduces a, a coarse grain entropy, where mm -hmm. which is is. Um, where you have a, a probability distribution, not over full distribution of, right. of phase space, but a coarse graining or certain variables, and then he shows that, that that can increase. Right. So if there's anything that the according to be gives can be used as tracking progress towards um, um, equilibrium, it's the coarse graining. Right. Right. So the, so so this is all. So the question about whether this can be used as track for tracking. Equilibration is raised in in, in Gibbs, and he gives and the correct, aware of it. Gives the correct answer. Yes. And, and I take it, you know, I don't know this literature well. You right. know it well. I, you know, I've heard David Wallace give these talks where he's trying to justify or endorse a more standard approach. And as near as I can tell, his approach is this: it's a Gibbsian approach where you you, you have some kind of partition. Uh, maybe not into large, maybe even into equal, equal size little cubes. You start with a row, you let it evolve under the Hamiltonian flow, and then at some moment, whatever moment, for whatever reason, you coarse grain in the sense of for each little cube, you figure out how much of row is in that cube, and then you redistribute it uniformly across the cube. And that will change, right? You know, that, that, that you then let flow. And then, then this Gibbs entropy will change if you have these interventions. Right. The question is, OK, mathematically that works, but what the hell is going on physically? Right. How are you thinking of these interventions, right? Why, why, why are you alternating between Hamilton 
foggy and, and horse grain and you know what how does that reflect the physical world? I mean, it's not a question of whether this gives you something that does what you want, but even if it does, it doesn't seem to do it by reflecting what's going on in the world. Uh, I have a question uh, for, for Wayne. Yes. Because, so when, when Boltzmann writes down his H theorem, that he defines the, the H as an integral F L and F, right. which looks very similar to the Gibbs entropy. So can you say why this kind of entropy Oh, um, then changes with, with time, and this one here is then constant. That, that, okay, that's good, because that actually is a coarse grained entropy. Because. Which um, one? The, 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 the Boltzmann H. Yeah. Because all he's doing is he's, um, he's looking at, he, he's partitioning the um, space of mo with a momentum into little bits, mm -hmm. and all he's doing is he's, ask, he, he's asking. For each little part, each little bit of bit, bit of momentum, how many molecules have mm -hmm. that? So that's mm -hmm. so so that so that actually is a coarse graining of of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the phase space. If you're, I'm not giving I'm not giving you the full specification of right. the phase of the system. I'm, I'm coarse graining. So actually, mm -hmm. that is a yeah, that is is a it gives coarse grain entropy. But, but it, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. isn't there I mean one difference? In that Boltzmann's uh, LNF yeah, F there right. is um, a distribution on, yeah, um, I guess a single particle phase space, whereas Gibbs's distributions can be on six n dimensional phase space. So um, they are on different yeah, so dimensionality phase space. All right, so here, here, here's the idea yeah. Boltzmann. Full state of the system is a point in six n dimensional phase space, right. right? Then what you do is um, you, you take um, that six n dimensional phase space is, is just n copies of the six dimensional space. You know, partition product. Mm -hmm. So if I want to um, you know, partition the momentum for each one of those and just say, it's a fact about the, fa the full the, the full phase space point in six dimensional space. How many of the particles are in each partition of momentum? So, what what he's what, he, what he's doing is he's and it is in effect a um, partition of the six dimensional phase space into states which share the same distribution of moment of momenta among the particles. That's it. I mean, I think that's right. I think that's right on. Yeah, I want to try to give an interpretation, I hope it's not too cynical, of uh, how did this Gibbs formula for entry come out of Boltzmann? And you give the combinatorial version of Boltzmann, it's the multinomial coefficient of the in states, and, and they, it's maximized when the in states are all equal numbers. And that's a formula that involves factorials. Mm -hmm. So how do you translate that into the Gibbs formula? And the answer is the serving approximation. That's which is okay. <laughs> which is an infinite series. Yeah. If you take the first two terms in the series, then you will get out this formula out of it. And that's where that was of course known in Boltzmann, and that's because you can't do derivatives all that with factorials. But once you translate into this uh, using algorithms, that's where the formula came from. Then you ask for Gibbs, how do you reproduce the Boltzmann formulas in a more, what he considered, better way? And then this is where all these canonical ensembles came from, because they're not physical, natural physical objects, but they're, they're ensembles defined in such a way so when you maximize that formula on it, you'll get the right results. Okay, if I'm following correctly, and I may not be, this may help explain why the form P L N P shows up. Yeah, yeah. That's the but, 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 but right. The, the script, that's where you're getting the Stirling approximation coming out of the combinatorics. But notice, again, if I'm following correctly, it's very important there are functions that are not probability measures. For example, if I say I've got a box of Avogadro numbers of particles, 
and then I coarse grain the one particle phase space the way they were just talking about. And then I ask for each of these little boxes that give me an approximate position, approximate momentum, how many of these particles are there, right? I'll get a function, but it's not a probability function because it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't go, you know, you don't, it doesn't integrate to one, it integrates to the total number of particles. Now you can renormalize it, right? But if that's the function you're dealing with, which I take it would be the relevant function for doing the combinatorics, you might get something that's of the form rho ln rho, but the rho would not naturally be a probability function. And you know, you, you would then might renormalize it to a probability function. But now you're talking about not the statistics of a huge ensemble of big systems, you're talking about the statistics of an actual huge ensemble of little systems, namely the ensemble of individual particles that are in this box of gas. Which is fine, but you just conceptually, conceptually you're doing something very different even though you're dealing with a lot of the similar mathematics. Right? So the, but the general point I'm trying to make is, is that Gibbs gave you a algorithm by which you can derive the right formulas. So, so, mm -hmm. and, and when you go to your question about what is the physical significance of these ensembles or probability distribution, then it gives you the right answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's and, you know, which we know both. And, and this, I mean, this comes up in other places. I don't know if we're we'll talking about. Some people think that you know. Uh, uh, aridicity is very important for thermodynamics and you can't, you know, your first reaction should be how could it be because the times, you know, the, the, the recurrence times are so incredibly long they can't have anything to do with anything you see in the lab. And then you can get a proof that, well, in an ergodic system, a kind of infinite time average will give you with an epsilon the same result as a, as a different average in a different, and you know, that, and then you understand make it easier to calculate. But at least you say, yeah, this, this is not, you know, the real physics is over here, and then you have a theorem that tells you mathematically you're going to get similar results to an unphysical, what's really kind of an unphysical question over here, but make it easier to calculate. And then you understand what you're doing, right? That's fine. Then you feel like, oh, I have some insight to what's going on. Um, but then you might need ergodicity for that equivalence to hold. And then you get confused when you think you need aridicity for the box of gas or whatever, which you don't. Um, uh, okay, so that's all I had to say about Gibbs, but we can come back tomorrow and, and, and Wayne will do something more sophisticated. The Shannon quote entropy, <laughs> which I talked about last year, uh, you know, Shannon's just doing something completely different. He's trying to maximize information transmission over channels. He's trying to, you know, be able to send as many telexes as he can over a fixed line with as few errors as possible. And in the course of doing that, he made use of a quantity minus P L N P, where again that really is a probability measure now. A probability measure of what? A probability measure that describes the actual statistics with which a transmitter produces a particular member of the alphabet. So if you were, you know, if you looked at how you type on a typewriter and you took the statistics of how, what percentage E's and T's and so on, you know, you would end up with what they found in Scrabble. There ain't so many Z's and there ain't so many Q's. That probability distribution over the letters you type is nothing like flat. And what Chan realized was that turns out to be quite an inefficient way to send information because Knowing one letter, you can actually make a pretty good educated guess in many cases about what the next letter will be. Like if it's a Q, you're probably going to be a U, and you're wasting, you know, you're wasting your bandwidth. And that the, the way to maximize the transmitted information over the bandwidth is to use a code such that this thing becomes maximized, which means, as we saw, flat probability distribution. Each letter in your alphabet should appear. Approximate, you know, one over each letter in your n, n letter alphabet should appear one over n times on average in the long term with no noticeable correlations. That's going to be the most efficient way to transmit information, which is fine and true and great, but it has nothing to do with anything. I mean, it just doesn't have anything to do with 
thermodynamics. It doesn't have anything to do. It, it, it has nothing to do with entropy in the normal sense. And you know, as as you know, there's this story which I take to be true that the reason Shannon called the quantity entropy was that it was on the advice of von Neumann, who said, "Look, it's minus something pro p log p. Call it entropy because nobody knows what entropy is." Which, to me, I think that's probably a perfectly true story. It makes sense, but it means. If you're doing physics and you're talking about entropy and all of a sudden people are talking about information and they're using Shannon entropy, it probably some deep conceptual confusion has just occurred. And in my experience, this happens all the time. And we talk about the information loss paradox and then talk about entropy, black hole entropy, and it's just, you know, begging for people to become totally confused between what kind of entropy they're talking about and how it's behaving and what's it is. Are you saying in the context of black hole information loss, people, some physicists call or refer to the black hole entropy as somehow related, as a kind of chain entropy? Yes, or absolutely. You, absolutely. It says, even though the black hole entropy is- Look, they're talking about information. information. They shouldn't be talking about information. But they, as soon as they talk about information, not surprisingly, they're drawn to Shannon's vocabulary. Yeah, but, but then they're also talking about the thermodynamics of black holes, which is, yeah. you know, what, and, and then it's just, it's become a complete and total mayor's test. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm confused about is the black hole, generalized black hole entropy formula is the, you know, the black hole entropy, which is related to its area, right? Mm -hmm. so like A over 4 times, I don't know, 1 over H bar, maybe some other constants. Yeah. Plus the von Neumann entropy of the quantum field that is yeah. back reacting on the black hole. Is so, exterior. Sorry? The, the matter field in the exterior of the black hole. Yes. Yeah, and yes, yes, yes. Generalized material pertains yes. to this area yes. of the black yes. hole plus, plus the exterior. whatever matter is on the outside. Right, right. Which should be so, everything else in the universe, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, ultimately. All the quantum fields <laughs> in the exterior of black hole. But, but I guess the question is, w which aspect of the generalized black hole entropy do they refer to as Shannon entropy? I would, look, I, I, I would have to go, I've heard this done, and I would really have to go do a search through papers to nail down exactly where these things are. I can't say, because it's, if I'm right, it's all a confusion and you don't expect a systematic answer <laughs> about how the confusion occurs. The confusion occurs because they have some number and they'd like to get another number and they think Shannon did something they might have you know. there, is, there is clearly a very high level of confusion. On the other hand, there is something strange, which is the fact that this second law seems to be something that holds in our universe yeah, to a large extent, and we don't really have an account for that. Well, and all and all all the all the stories of the calculation of entropy, mm -hmm. you know, the, the successful, supposedly successful, supposedly evaluations of entropy in quantum gravity programs, in a sense, do not address the yeah. issue of why this law. So are we, you know, this is going to be a great topic that you're going to lead us into, right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. But let me clarify that it's not because I have an answer. It's yeah. Because I don't like the, what the, the, the proposed yeah. answers. Yeah. I don't understand it. No. This is a, I mean, again, this is a topic anybody you know, looking for a PhD thesis, my guess is to just say, all right, let me sort through some highly regarded papers mm -hmm. on this topic. And see if they're coherently put together. Fine. Yeah, just just a small technical point. The PI stand for message probabilities, and then the problem is how do you code the messages using shorter um, code words in your coding alphabet? Could be zeros and ones, and you get you down very all sorts of messages depending on the probabilities, and, and the lower limit on the size of the average code word is the Shannon entropy. So it really lives right. in, in coding. What, what you would like is that your the actual trans 
transmitter that sends the message over the wire. The code for the message, you can say. The code set maximizes this. The plain text doesn't, right? I mean, your, your real source is somebody typing on a typewriter, and the plain text absolutely does not maximize this. And then there's a question, well, are there efficient ways to code the plain text into a new code that will then do better with respect to Shannon entropy and give me more bandwidth when I'm sending across the wires. So you want, you want your average code to be a small as possible. Yeah, yeah, and this is the lower limit. That's, yeah. you're, you're trying to that's right. This is this is this is the ideal. Yeah. Right? This is you would be doing as well. And again, there's a kind of, I guess I pointed this out last year, there's a kind of irony because in thermodynamic equilibrium arguably you can't send messages at all. That the actual sending and receiving of messages requires that you be out of equilibrium. Whereas the sending of actual messages in the best possible way happens when the Shannon entropy is maximized. Right? As if we're at Shannon equilibrium. It's not really equilibrium because it's not even a dynamical quantity. Right? It's not a quantity that anything tends to. But the maximum Shannon entropy is the most efficient signaling situation. And the maximal thermodynamic entropy kills the possibility of signaling. Well, but there's, there, there, there's an analogy there, right? Because when you send a message, you send a unique message. You are pointing, it, it, it will correspond to giving a precise point within in what in the Boltzmann's uh, view would be this macro state or this. So you are pointing to one individual point within a very large <laughs> set. And then you could say by by giving that you are providing an enormous amount of information because you are distinguishing that point from a very, very large uh, possibility of of alternatives. While while you know, you're yes, just I'm getting I'm a point that or in a subset that has just three points, then you, you are not. I mean, so it, it, it so it, 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 there's a, tr a bunch of tricky stuff here conceptually. I'll just gesture at it. I, I don't know how much we want to talk about uh, about communication theory. Obviously, what for what Shannon is doing, just as a practical matter, it's important that you're talking about averages over the long term. Because so, someone could say, look, here's a code, uh, you know, A equals A, blah, 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 but, but uh, if I ever said QQ, that stands for the entire text of Moby Dick. And, uh, you know, in the rare circumstance where I use QQ, you say, man, you've said a hell of a lot of information very efficiently there. But the, the idea is that you have this, you know, you have this statistical collection of possible texts. Yep. And you want it, the average code length to be short. Um, and you know, that, that was just a practical situation that he had. Um, okay. And again, I, I, again, it is not obvious to me if, if, if there's any deep connection at all between Shannon entropy and thermodynamic or statistical mechanical entropy. I, again, if someone wants to. Enlighten me to that spot. But I'm not, I'm not about to enlighten you. Okay. Uh, well, don't make me dumb. <laughs> I, can't <promise. laughs> I can't promise that. Um, <laughs> it might spread. Um, th there is something in that last point. I mean, so physicists get slightly suspicious when the same mathematics turns up in two different situations. And so you say that you know, this is mathematics if there's a simple harmonic oscillator. And you can say, oh, you know, that started off being just the mathematics of a, a spring. And it was a, a hoop saw. Or yeah, something. Was Someone was watching a lantern swing, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly it's it's everywhere, but it's sort of mutually everywhere. So uh, this this sort of would seem to lead us down the wrong path. That we, oh, it's about shadow entropy, it's about information, so it's about states of uncertainty, and so the so you should go back to Gibbs and say these probabilities are 
Right. Uh, just uncertainties, and, and, and that is the wrong place I, to end I, I think if you find, I, look, I agree. If you find the same mathematics popping up in what look like different places, uh, it, it, it provokes an interesting question you should ask, which is, is there some deeper commonality here right. uh, that we're missing? But you should be prepared for the answer to be no. <laughs> Right. You should be prepared. Maybe the answer is no. It's just by coincidence we're doing very different things, and the same math happened to pop up. Um, maybe you know. It, I mean, this example about Sterling's formula suggests that gee, you know, you're dealing with combinatorics, and then you're taking approximations, and you have large numbers. You take the first three terms, the four terms, and you get a totally different formula. Yeah. So you know, I mean, there's just lots of possible answers to uh, to, to this, and you know, I don't mind people having their curiosity peaked. But then their intellectual obligation is to go do some heavy sure. state work and figure out you know, whether there's anything to it, and there might not be.